Okay, welcome to lecture 10 part B or part 2. Um, during this part we'll be continuing looking at solving Laplace's equation using techniques from complex analysis um, and in particular we're going to just simply apply it to a different geometric situation. In other words, the boundary condition is different in this particular example. So just a reminder, um, we're working with functions that obey Laplace's equation and this and an example of such a function is either the real in part of a real or imaginary part of an analytic complex function. In other words, we have that f of z is a complex function where both its real and imaginary parts obey Laplace's equation. And as I discussed more slowly in part two, we then have two theorems that are associated with analytic functions on the region R, namely that the function, um, the integral of the function around the boundary is equals to zero. And we have Cauchy's integral theorem that basically says the function um, in the interior of this region, f of z, is simply equals to 1 over 2 pi i, the integral around the boundary of f of w, in other words, f evaluated on the boundary, divided by w minus z. And in the previous part, the first part of this lecture, we solved the, um, the, the Laplace equation on a disk using these two properties to write down the solution. And we're going to do a similar thing now, um, except that we're going to change the boundary conditions. In other words, we're going to find a solution for the Laplace of u equals to zero on the upper half plane. And it's basically to illustrate, excuse me, the difference um, and actually the boundary condition actually makes to the solution itself. Okay, so there we have, we want to solve what Laplace u is equals to zero um, on this region, which is the upper half plane. And we're going to assume we're basically given the boundary condition, in other words, given u on this complex line. Okay, so the way we do that is once again to apply Cauchy, the two Cauchy theorems, except in a slightly different manner. So we, here we're going to say if z is in R, in other words, if z is in the upper half plane, then z bar is not in the half plane. So z's there, z bar's here, then z bar is not in the upper half plane because it sits here below the line. And therefore we can say that f of w, which is basically f on the boundary, um, over w minus z bar is analytic in R. Okay, so because this denominator is never zero if z bar does not, is, is never zero on R, if z bar doesn't lie in R, this thing is analytic. Okay, in other words, it admits a power series expansion. Okay, and the caveat is f of w must be analytic, or f of z must be analytic on R. Okay, and so once again we proceed and we show that because z bar doesn't lie on the region, in other words, the upper half plane, this int line integral along the boundary is zero because this thing is analytic. Okay, and we again make the combination, we sort of combine the two um, Cauchy's uh, integral theorem over here with a second expression and um, we're now making a function of z. I might say, if you recall the previous example, the reason we made this combination is so that we basically in the end ended up with some function on the boundary multiplied by a real function um, of which we took the integral. And the same thing is what we're trying to achieve here. We want this thing in brackets to actually be real on the boundary itself that we are considering so that it becomes easy to implement the boundary conditions. And while it may appear to be somewhat ad hoc the way we chose z, it's simply with that aim in our mind. And so all I'm aiming to do during this lecture is actually to show you that the answer works. Uh, the way in which you actually construct this thing that you multiply it with is an art. Right? It's called a method of images and I might come back to it later. But right now I simply want to show you that we can, that it is actually possible to write down the exact analytic answer to this problem. Okay, so we have f of z is equals to this integral, 
which is true by the Cauchy's theorem and the Cauchy's integral theorem. And now the thing, the tricky part becomes to write this complex line integral in terms of real variables on this boundary. So we're basically going to choose our boundary to be this half circle. In other words, it's going to be an integral from minus rho to plus rho. And it's going to then, we're going to integrate along the circle over here. So this is our closed um, complex integral or the integral along the boundary. And we now want to express this in terms of the real and imaginary parts because we're aiming ultimately to get a real integral. So to look at this integral, to write it actually out, we're first going to look at um, this part along the line and we're going to consider rho to go to infinity. So this part along the line is simply the integral from minus rho, which is minus infinity, to rho, which is infinity. And it's going to be f of w, in other words, f evaluated on the line. So w is simply the real axis. Okay. Um, so that's simply x bar, which is, and then we're going to integrate along this real axis. So we're going to have dx bar. And then we're going to have this w, which is x prime, sorry, x bar, listen to me, x prime minus z. So there we have x prime minus x minus i y minus 1 over um, x prime, which is w, minus z bar, which is just this, minus x plus i y. Okay, so that's the first part of the integral, but we must consider this part of the integral along the half circle as well. And so where that comes in is the way we write that down, that's simply the integral, and we put it now in, instead of, um, in polar coordinates, the integral from 0 to pi, where theta is basically that angle, in other words. So we, the integral from 0 to pi, so it's the upper half plane, f of w, okay, and f on that circle is simply rho times e to the i f, um, theta, and we're going to set let rho go to infinity, over... Um, 2 pi i, which comes from there, times um, this uh, w, uh, 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 times this factor, and that factor we have expressed as 1 over um, w, and I've taken out the factor of w over here for purposes that will become clear. So it's basically w minus z minus 1 over w, which is rho e to the i theta, which I've taken out over here, minus z bar. Okay, so this um, brown part is basically the contribution of the integral along this boundary. And we have to take the limit as rho goes to infinity. So be very careful over here when you go from this step of the complex integral complex line integral around a closed region to actually your real integrals, you must be very, very careful how you implement the boundary. And um, it's simply here is the real line part and this is the part along that the circle and we're letting rho ultimately go to infinity. So what we do now is look at this brown part, okay? As rho goes to infinity, and this is the reason why I factored it out. Here you basically have z over infinity, so it's equals to zero. Um, and here you have z bar basically over infinity. It doesn't matter what the angle is. So that's also zero. So you basically have one minus one, which is zero. And then we have an additional row over here. So that's also going to suppress it and make it zero. So this term, as rho goes into infinity, this whole... Um, integrand over here, regardless of what f is, as long as f is bounded, in fact, um, it's going to, or in fact, even if f diverges, like 1 over, r, um, sort of 1 over rho, it is actually going to be um, 0. Sorry, even if f diverges like rho, it is still going to be 0. Okay, so the second term vanishes. So all our line integral then becomes is the integral along the real axis over here. 
Okay. And as I said, this thing vanishes so strongly because you have a zero over here multiplied by a one over infinity, which is effectively zero, is we definitely know that f of z is bounded at infinity. Okay, so now we're left to evaluate this integral. Okay, we want to evaluate the first term and we simply have to, to start, we have to evaluate this thing in brackets and it's the same method as we used in the past. We put it over the same um, denominator, so you multiply this thing by its complex conjugate and you multiply this thing by its complex conjugate and you put it over the same and you put it over the same denominator, so this thing multiplies by its complex conjugate is just simply x bar minus x squared plus y, the same over here, and above you have the complex conjugate of this guy minus the complex conjugate of that guy, and that then evaluates to 2iy over x prime minus x squared plus y squared. Okay, so now we've simplified basically the term that goes in there and what remains is now we can write down our integral f of z simply as 2i over 2 pi i times the integral from minus infinity to infinity if evaluated along the real line with x prime times y that comes from there over the numerator or oh, sorry the denominator over here and just remember we're taking the integral over x prime but the actual values of the function um, f, y, and x are still slaved in here in the answer. Okay, just simplifying one more step, and there we have now an expression for the complex function f of z as an integral of the complex function evaluated along the real line um, with another integrand. Okay, and once again we can say let's consider only the real part of the solution because this uh, integrand apart from f of x is real and um, we're only interested in that part so we can let f of z be u of x and y plus i v of x and y and um, f evaluated on the, along the real axis so it's basically f of x is simply equals to f of 1 x prime plus i f2 of x prime along the real line and what we then have is that if we look only at the real part of this thing it gives a valid solution for u because we constructed u as basically assuming u is an analytic function and therefore obeys Laplace's equation so it give, provides a solution for Laplace equation equals to zero for in the upper half plane for y greater than zero with u of x y equals to f1 of x if y is equals to zero okay so once again um, this is very very powerful because we have we can write down the solution in general um, simply as an integral of the function that we're given on the axes um, with this other integrand over here um, where the actual dependence depends on x and y. So it becomes very, very easy to evaluate. And evaluating a real integral is also very easy. I mean, numerically, there's a number of rules to do it. And often, analytically, you can get the answer as well. And an important consequence from this is that u is bounded um, as x squared plus y squared approaches infinity because they appear in the denominator over here. So eventually, um, if x squared and y squared approach infinity, you basically have that the denominator of your integrand goes to zero, and so the contribution from that part actually is zero. Okay. And so here I've just written it out. You can take the y over here out of the integrand as I did there, and that's where that comes from, because you're only integrating over x prime. So you now they have that u x y is simply equals to y times y over pi times the integral from minus infinity to infinity f of x prime over um, this integrand. And this once again is an important result. Um, as I said later on we'll show that the solution is in fact unique. 
um, but it has the very very nice feature that you can actually simply whenever you have a new boundary condition that you're given you simply put a new function in here do the integral again you don't have to change the calculations terribly um, and then you already have the dependence within the domain on X and Y over there okay so what I'm going to do next is simply we've now written down the general solution of U of X and Y to Laplace's equation provided you're given a function of U on the real line and all I want to do now is simply give you an example where actually we have a specific function that's given on the real line um, and then evaluate the integral to show you what the solution actually does okay so let f of x on the real line be 1 in a region between 0 and 1 and 0 otherwise okay so it's actually not a differentiable function or it's not even a continuous function it's basically a box but we can evaluate the solution for that this particular function as well so there we have so this is our value on the real line um, of u it simply is a box function and we want to see what it looks like or what the solution actually looks like and to do that we actually have to evaluate this integral for u that we derived on the previous line so here we have u of x and y is equal to y over the integral from minus infinity to infinity of the initial condition divided by this integrand. Okay? And our initial condition is this, so basically we now only have to worry about the integral from 0 to 1 because that's the only place where f of x has a non-zero value. Okay, So we can write that as this now f of x is from goes from 0 to 1 and we want to in, integrate 1 over x prime minus x squared plus y squared and this is the integral you should have been introduced to in your first year it's the square of things below the line in particular the square of x squared and then we can either do it um, you can either recognize tan um, but it's anyway it's one of the classic substitutions that you actually need to be able to do to do these integrals because you have the sum of squares below the line so you expect a tan um, function to appear somewhere and so to see how it appears let us do the substitution where we say x prime minus x um, is equals to y my, uh, times tan of z and then the reason we do this is basically to get rid of the denominator because when you take the derivative of tan let's see what happens okay so let's see take the differ differential after the substitution so you have dx prime is equals to y derivative of tan is 6 squared dz okay and here unfortunately the z was but it's not a complex number it's just another real number okay so that's our differential and now we're going to substitute this into the integral and if we substitute it in the first thing to observe that is that x squared um, plus x prime minus x squared plus y squared is merely equals to y squared um, tan squared plus y squared and 1 plus tan squared is 6 squared so the, numer the denominator becomes y squared over 6 squared and we have the dx prime is just y times 6 squared but we had another y out in front so we have y squared times 6 squared so these things are actually going to cancel and be equals to 1 the complexity arises when we implement the boundary conditions right so we now um, integrating over dz so we have that when x prime is equals to 0 that um, tan of z is equals to minus x over y and we have to take the arctan of that so it's the arctan of minus x over y the second um, boundary is when x prime is equals to 1 in other words 1 over there we have 1 minus x divided by y is equals to tan z so the second boundary is the arctan of 1 minus x over y and so there we go um, 
the integral of 1 is just z and we're going to evaluate it at the two boundaries and we're left with an explicit answer um, which is very very nice we've now so now we basically have the solution of Laplace's equation where that we know that the value on the boundary or the real axis is simply this box function and then as y increases it's simply the sum of these two arctan terms. Okay, and what is nice is even though the boundary condition was not continuous or in fact differ or differentiable, the solution is. So just check that this thing is both continuous and differentiable if y is greater than zero because you can take the derivative and there's no zeros in the boundary, so we're done. Um, and as I mentioned previously, with PDEs, it's very important to actually take, um, to check your answer. So you can differentiate this thing. You can com basically here compute uxx um, plus uyy, and you'll find that it obeys Laplace's equation. But we also want in addition that this thing actually gives you the right answer as y approaches zero. Okay, so as... Um, so, and there are two tricky things, because as y approaches zero, this thing explodes, right? So you have to be careful when you do this, and you have to take the limit to actually check that it, the solution gives you your initial condition in a systematic way. And I'm just going to give you an example of how to do this consistently to completely check that the solution you've been given actually has this thing as an initial condition. So what we're now going to do is take the limit as y approaches 0 and x approaches 0. In other words, we're approaching basically the origin. And we want to show you that the function actually behaves like this. Okay, so here become the messy details. So as y approaches 0, we have that we are taking the arctan of infinity. And fortunately, we can do that. The arctan of infinity is just pi over 2 um, because it asymptotes um, to pi over 2. Um, that part is easy, but if we, have, if we look at the second term, in other words, the arctan of x over y, we have both y and x approaching 0, so we have 0 over 0, and we have to have to be more careful. And the way we are more careful is we let we go to polar coordinates that are centered a lot about the origin, so at y equals zero and x equals zero. So when I let x equals to r cos theta, y equals to r sine theta. So we basically have this situation, and we're going to see what it actually means, or this expression actually means. Okay, so then we have x over y um, equals to. So we're looking at this term equals to the cot of theta, and that is simply equals to tan of pi minus theta. Okay, so the arctan of x over y is then just pi over 2 minus theta. And finally, we can combine this thing with that expression, and we have that um, theta approaches a half plus a half minus um, uh, theta over pi, sorry, u approaches a half plus a half minus theta over pi, and so that's equals to 1 minus theta over pi. And so you can see that as theta varies, okay, from theta equals to pi over here, the value of u is 0, and then when theta equals to um, z basically 0, which is on this side, the value of u is 1. So we have that the limit actually represents the transition of this um, function very well, where it actually transitions from a value of 1 on this side of the line to a value of 0 over there. Okay, so depending on theta, the limit varies between 1 and 0. And we're at least happy that the function approaches this value of f of x correctly in the limit. Okay, so 
the solution just to make another features other features of the solution to explore the features of the solution to give you an idea of what it is is the R10 of the argument looks something like that okay so what we've done here with well, the solution is basically the R10 of x over y it's the sum of two of them except that in the second one the argument is flipped so we're basically going to have um, this solution plus that solution except that it is flipped in the following like that so you can actually see um, over here you're going to have the second branch basically cancelling out this branch below over here you're going to have the two of them add together to make almost like a, um, that square hump and then once you've passed one you're basically going to have them cancel out again so what's going to happen what the solution is actually going to look like is it's going to start with a box on the axes and then it's going to become the edges of the blocks going to again they become smoother and smoother and it's going to basically be this spreading out disappearing hump um, and just to complete the exercise in the limit as you approach the axes in other words y equals to zero but you approach the second value of x equals to one you can once again see that you actually approach that other side of the box Okay, and I'm just going to do it. In this particular case, if you have this situation, then your arctan approaches the arctan, so arctan of x over y approaches the arctan of infinity, which is equal to pi over 2, so that becomes the easy one. Um, and the, the second, um, when you want to evaluate the second part of the function, namely this arctan of 1 minus x, you can again expand it in terms of polar coordinates, except centered at x equals to 1, y equals to 0, as follows. And you can do the same thing. You can then have 1 minus x over y is equals to minus r cos theta over sine theta times r, which is equals to minus the tan of pi over 2 minus theta. And you can again, as a result, find that the arc tan of 1 minus x is equals to y, so this expression. And so in the limit as um, y approaches 0 at the point x equals to 1 you're again going to have that u approaches basically this thing arctan of 1 minus x over y plus a half which is equals to theta over, over pi and you're going to find that when theta is equals to 0 u is 0 in other words if you remember that box that we had on this side and we're evaluating at x equals to 1 on this side it's 0 and as theta equals to pi the function is equals to 1 okay so we've really got a solution found a valid solution that obeys the initial condition even though the initial condition was not smooth or in fact differentiable um, we've got us and it obeys the Laplace's equation which you can verify either via application of the theorems or simply in this case simply directly differentiating this function um, and yeah so we found a valid solution of, of equation of the Laplace's equation obeying that box boundary condition um, and for all practical purposes it appears unique we will prove that it is unique in, sub in a subsequent lecture thank you very much this concludes lecture 10